Got it. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see so many people. Welcome to Carol and Joanne and Richard and Joy and Terry and Katie and, of course, Neil. And um, please mute yourself. <laughs> Put the dog on mute. <laughs> yeah, I think I should. Yeah, after I to do, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself. Can we let one sec? Ron, can you let let uh, Barkley into the porch, please? He doesn't bark. All right, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not in my own house, so I don't, I don't have the same control that I usually have. Um, all right, thank you all for coming. Um, love, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Terry Emery, who's our speaker for today. Um, I was very, very thrilled that uh, Neil knew her because I had, actually, I had actually corresponded with her after I, wrote, after I read her book, Second Acts, uh, a few years ago, because it spoke to me. It spoke to me, it was about three young women. She's gonna talk about voice. And in this book, she speaks with the voice of these three women who, who, who tell you their story. They were friends from college and um, they went to college very close to where I went to college. They went at the same time. Um, we had some of the same adventures. I didn't have such a colorful life as they did, but um, we had some of the same adventures and I felt very, very connected. Anyhow, I wrote to her because I had just I was in the process of writing my book, 50 States, and I asked her as a local author my, her advice about a publisher. We had a nice back and forth. And, and then when Neil told me that he knew her, I was really thrilled because I felt, you know, like we had that connection. I could come to her to, to take one of our presentations. So she's going to talk about voice. So she's written second. She, she is, she's been a writer all her adult life, wrote different kinds of things, uh, um, uh, in many ways, speeches, brochures, uh, poems, reports. And she taught various classes on college levels. So she's been uh, she's been uh, involved in all aspects of, of of writing. And then, as as a as a fairly recent thing, she became an author. So Second Acts was her first book, and she has a sequel coming out, which is called The Right Re The Right Regrets. Kind of hard to say, Terry. The Right Regrets. And um, she's going to speak to us about creating voice in our characters. So I think uh, you know I think we'll benefit a lot from from this. So I'm gonna, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Terry and let her take it away. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Um, it's a nice introduction. I should, one of the things I didn't mention when you asked me about my background is that I wrote a magazine column, a humor column for a city magazine when I lived in, in Florida for, for 15 very long years. And, um, and I, I wrote a, a, a humor column and, I had never done journalism before. I hadn't hadn't had any training in it. And it was great training because when you write for a publication like that on a monthly basis, they tell you how many words and they tell you when it's due. And if you don't have the right number of words and you and you don't get it in on deadline, you're sunk. So um, so that's a really if you have a chance to write for a for a, a, a publication on a regular basis, it's great training for a writer. Um, so I did I did want to mention that. Anyway, um, I'm going to what I'm going to do is read you my thoughts. I'm going to read you what I wrote about about creating voice in your characters and you are welcome to um, take notes, interrupt if you if you feel the urge, um, but at the end, there'll be a, a, um, a chance for some give and take and you can ask me anything at all. So um, I'm gonna begin with the first piece of advice I give to any writer who wants to get published. And that is the first five to 10 pages of what you write are the most important. That's all that the person you send your manuscript to is going to read. And you know, you you identify a publisher or an agent. You'd like to read your work. The agent or the publisher may say, "Send me the first fifty pages." Trust me, they're only going to read the first five. And and the person you're writing to is not going to read it. They're going to give it to the summer intern um, because they don't know you. And so you are um, uh, you are in what they call the slush pile. And, um, and in order to get out of the slush pile and get noticed, that first five to 10 pages has to grab the publisher and, and pull the reader in. 
Um, if you've read Amazon reviews of books, you can probably tell most of the people who wrote them, or well, not most, but many of those reviews were written after the person read five pages or 10 pages. They don't, they don't wait to read the whole thing before they let loose. Okay. So now in those first five to 10 pages, you're gonna be introducing a main character and maybe other characters. The main character especially has to be strong, unique and consistent through the story, okay? That's, that's, that's really important. That helps to build a voice that's recognizable and that will keep your reader engaged. Um, your reader will view whoever is introduced or speaks first in the story as your main character. And that character will set the tone for the story. My book, uh, Lynn mentioned that, that um, in second acts, I've got three narrators. Why three? Why did I make my life more complicated? That's the way the story came to me. I heard it. I don't wanna sound like I'm hearing voices. I'm crazy, but I did hear it that way. Wow. Three, I heard three, three distinct voices. I, when I wrote it, I thought that all three of them were carrying their weight equally. Each of them moves the story along equally. I, an award-winning novelist I had the privilege of, of working with, he was a colleague of mine at Hunter College in New York. Uh, he told me that <laughs> uh, he read my early, early draft and uh, he said, Sarah, the first person who speaks in, in my book, it, Sarah's not strong enough. You know, she's the main character. I said, well, no, she's not. She's a third of the story. He said, nope, your reader will see her as the main character. And she's, you gotta get out some of that description and narration and get her speaking. She's gotta be, they've gotta hear her voice at the beginning because no matter what you think, the first character to speak, or if you're not writing in the first person, the first character you introduce will be seen by the reader as the main character. And so, and so you need to, to make your characters um, uh, strong and easily definable at, at their at I felt, you know, I would, as I worked on second acts, these characters were speaking to me if I knew them. Um, I was talking to them and, and that's, a lot of writers will tell you they, they, they do that. Um, if you need to, um, know your characters better. Something I, I recommend, and this may sound a little crazy. Has anybody ever heard of the Marcel Proust character questionnaire? Do you, anybody know what that is? Marcel Proust oh, yeah. was a French writer, right? Um, wrote, I think he died in the, in the, maybe in the early 20th century, the 20s, 1920s or something. And he, he was, you know, he wrote Remembrance of Things Past, which is the, the four volume story of his life. Um, and he, he was also a critic and an essayist. And he said, he, he made up this questionnaire and he said, if you answer all these questions for me, I can tell you anything about yourself. I'll really know you. And Google is your friend. Go Google, go Google Marcel Proust character questionnaire. Download it and talk to your characters and ask your characters to answer these questions for you. So the questions are things like, your idea of perfect happiness? What's your favorite, favorite journey? What's your greatest regret? What talent would you most like to have? Who are your heroes in fiction? Who are your heroes in real life? What phrases or words do you think you overuse? How would you like to die? What living person do you most admire? On what occasions do you lie? Now, it's interesting to, to answer these questions, but it will be very helpful to you to get your characters to answer these questions. And, and um, you, will, um, you will learn something about them. You'll also learn something about yourself as, as, as a writer. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that your, your characters have to be consistent. Um, people, people are full of, of surprises and um, and yet people are usually consistent with their basic traits. Your characters have to be that way. If you think about 
think about beloved characters from long running TV series and how viewers kept going back because they wanted to, they wanted to see them because they fell in love with, with these characters. They related to them, they identified with them. So um, one, of, one of my um, guilty pleasures during COVID is that I have seen every episode of Columbo, right? <laughs> The old, the old, that was I, I watch it. I watch every episode, some of them several times, you know, and um, the writing is 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 brilliant. And I love Peter Falk now. Um, and think about um, uh, think about Columbo. We know that character. We know his quirks. We know what he's going to how he's going to respond in certain situations without his being predictable or boring in important ways. Same with the women in Sex in the City. Think of the women in Sex in the City. The series, they were consistent from beginning to end. They had adventures that were surprising, but they, they were themselves from beginning to end. So if Lieutenant Columbo suddenly started taking bribes or Carrie Bradshaw, uh, Bradshaw on Sex in the City suddenly got religion, um, I think I think their they would have lost their audiences, right? So consistency, beginning to end, that's really important. Um, if you're writing a memoir, I understand some of you are working on memoirs. Um, if you're writing a memoir, then your main character is you, and it wouldn't be a bad idea if you gave yourself the Proust questionnaire for purposes of your memoir. Your challenge will be to find the facets of your life that most fit with the image you want to create, the mood you want to set, the, the, the piece of your life, this, that story that you want to tell. Most people live multiple lives, and it's unlikely that any of them will, will, will fit in one book. But um, I'm telling you, that questionnaire will, will help you reveal aspects of your, of your persona that, that will be very useful. Um, I suggest no matter what you are writing, a memoir, a children's book, um, science fiction, uh, you know, whatever, that you read the very best writers in that genre. Again, Google is your friend. Go on the internet, find the prize winning authors, the authors who have stayed um, who have built a, a following and stayed and 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 kept their following? Um, when I when this crazy idea of writing in three voices came to me to write second acts, I reread a book that I found remarkable in many ways. It's called The Joy Luck Club um, oh. by, by Amy Ted. She's got four narrators in that book, and my my concern was that people other than me would read what I wrote and they wouldn't be able to keep the voices apart. Um, and I thought, how did, you know, how did I, how can I, can, can I make sure that other people will hear these voices distinct from each other the way I did? And so I reread The Joy Luck Club to see how Amy Tan did it. And by the way, if you haven't read the book, if you haven't seen the movie, it's the best adaptation of a comp, a movie ad adaptation of a complicated novel I have I think I've, I've ever seen and um so it, so if you're having trouble with some aspect of creating your character take a look at how the pros do it um back to the first 10 pages where you're introducing your character okay first five to ten pages my suggestion is that you start with dialogue Start with dialogue. Dialogue, let your character speak. In the end, you may edit it and take out some of the dialogue. But the problem with narration or description that's not dialogue is that it slows things down. It slows down the pace of the story. I have particular trouble with that when I write. Um, I'm so eager for my reader to know every little detail about my characters that I tend to put in more narration and description than I should. And um, for the first time in my writing career, um, I, am work, I am part of a, of, of a book, uh, of a writer's group. There are only three of us. The other two are in New York. Thank you, Zoom. We can now meet 
uh, regularly and we exchange our work. These are, uh, one is a playwright and an actress. The other is a playwright, novelist and actress. They are uh, both uh, brilliantly talented. And their advice to me over and over again, as they read, I'm working on a new novel, as they, as I, um, as they read sections of my novel, they are always having to remind me to cut out some of the narration and get back to dialogue. And I, I in fact, when I was writing Second Acts and I got, and I got that, um, that advice from a friend who read, who read an early draft, I put a little sticky note in the corner of my uh, computer screen and it said, make something happen. Right. So more, more than, more than de description, you need, you need dialogue, you need your, your, your character, characters to be talking to each other. You need your main character. Um, you need your main character to, to come alive through, through what he or she says. Um, it's interesting to work with these two writers who are both actors. Um, they've been of help to me because they know when to end a scene. So they will say, you need to end it right here. You know, page, page 12, the next six paragraphs, break them up and put them in other places, but don't slow down the, don't slow down the action. So start with, start with dialogue, see how much of it you can get in at the beginning. You can add a little bit of narration late, later, but that will get you going. Um, as you introduce other characters besides your main character, um, you need to limit the number of, 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 of extraneous characters you have. Um, unless you're writing this century's answer to war and peace, you don't need a million characters and you don't have to name them all. One of the most helpful pieces of advice I got from the wonderful editor at my publisher um, was that I had too many characters and she said, she said, you don't have to name every waiter. You're, these women meet in every restaurant. And if you're gonna name them, for goodness sake, give them interesting names. I mean, I had all these characters who, did, who were, weren't serving the plot. They weren't moving the story along. They were just kind of background, um, a, a, a background decor to the, you know, to the scene and, and they were all named Bill and Bob and Dave and Dan and, and they served absolutely no purpose. I didn't see that. She did and, it, and when I took out those unnecessary characters and those names, it tightened up the page, every page. So, so that's really good. Um, anybody ever hear of something called Chekhov's gun? Do you know what that is? Okay, Chekhov was a, was a, a, a famous um, Russian playwright and, and an actor, um, uh, an actor and, a, and an essayist. And he wrote a lot about, about uh, theory of drama theory. And there's a, there's a um, one of the things he said, and I'm gonna read this. Um, if in the first act of your play, you hang a pistol on the wall, then in the following act, it needs to be fired. <laughs> Otherwise, don't put it there. This is called Chekhov's gun, and my and my actor friends who are my in my in my book are are all there. They talk about this frequently because, in terms of a novel or a memoir or a children's book or whatever, your your gun, your Chekhov's gun, could be a waiter in a restaurant, right? A character, a a, a snippet of dialogue. Um, that doesn't move the plot along. If it doesn't, if it isn't helping you tell your story in a in a um, a, a fast paced way, it doesn't belong there. So Chekhov's gun. Give your writing the Chekhov's gun test. You know, if you got the gun in the first act, somebody's got to fire it. Um, settings can help you define your character and 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 here's a here's a, a lesson learned um when my book came out i was um thrilled that i was asked to give an interview for a, a british online publication about books i thought oh, i'm the toast of two continents now this is fabulous and i and i and the topic was when setting becomes a character and I thought it was a great review. And um, I don't seem to have a printout, the hard copy of the interview and the link 
to the publication doesn't work. And I can't seem to find that. So uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of everything you can do online, but make yourself a copy of everything, you know, everything. I didn't do that and I am so sorry. But what I want to say to you today is that settings can help you define your character, but they can also be characters in themselves. A setting can be a character. So think how much um, we learn about Scarlett O'Hara because of, of her feelings for Tara, right? Tara is, a, is as much a character in Gone with the Wind. It helps define Scarlet and it helps you, it helps create a, a, a setting that's very important to the plot. Think of how important New York City is to Law and Order or Seinfeld, right? Um, in second acts, uh, one of my characters experiences a terrible loss and she finds comfort when, 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 she, when she's just so sad and, and, and so lost in her grief. She finds comfort in transporting herself back to a semester in college when she, when she, um, when she did a, a semester abroad in Rome. And Rome becomes as important to, to her story as anything she says. So setting can, um, can be a, a, a support. It can depress your character. It can cheer your character up. It can seduce them for better or worse. Um, and um, it can be a, a support or a foil for your character. So think about developing the setting as if it were a character. So back to where I started with the first 10 pages, when you have edited the hell out of them and you think they're ready for public consumption, give the pages to someone you can trust to critique them. When I do that, um, I, 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 my instruction is, here's the work, be brutal, please. Um, you don't want, um, I see Joanne nodding her head. Um, I, I, you know, you don't want, um, this isn't going to your, your, your mother, your best friend, um, you know, people who love you and think everything you do is wonderful and are proud of you for writing as they should be. You needed to give it to somebody who will be brutal with their comments, and you know, somebody you, 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 um, you trust. You wanna ask, in terms of characters, you wanna ask to this critic you have chosen to see if they see the characters the way you do. Ask them, ask them um, you know, I, I, I was hoping my character would be um, vulnerable in this chapter or super smart in this chapter or um, romantic or sentimental or difficult. Did you get that when you read this? Um, is my hero heroic enough? Is my villain villainous enough? Um, a reader seeing it with new eyes um, will let you know whether or not you've done what you, in, what you set out to do. And, um, and most of all, you need to say, you need to ask your, your, this critic you have chosen, um, do you wanna spend more time with this character? Is this somebody you want to be with? Um, I have seen um, uh, a lot of, um, you know, I taught, when I taught writing, um, uh, be, because I was working with college kids, I, I, I always include a lot of pop culture in, in, in my, in my um, examples for them. And I encourage them to watch TV, to watch as a reader and a writer, to watch as a writer. So, and, and I, I meant to say this earlier, when you, when you read the genre you're trying to write, when you choose, let's say you're trying to write a memoir, so now you're reading prize-winning memoirs, you need to read them not recreationally, but as a writer. You need to have goals when you are when you are reading this, so that um, you're you're looking for how this writer handled the issue that you're having trouble with, right? So when I when I reread second when I reread um, uh, Joy Luck Club when I was working on on second acts, I read to see how. 
she kept those voices distinct. What she did, how she introduced them, how long each se segment was for each character, the order in which she presented them. Um, so you need to you know, read, not as just a reader, as a, as a writer. And, um, and so um, the last thing I will say in this segment is that uh, I truly believe that putting words on paper is an act of bravery. <laughs> putting words on paper to, to, and to give somebody else the chance to read it is, is a courageous act. And it's also very hard work. So uh, the French author Balzac, you know, I'm mentioning a lot of French authors. Can you tell I was a French major in college? Um, uh, the French author Balzac said that it is as easy to dream a book as it is difficult to write one. So I wish you all uh, the best of luck with both your dreams and your writing. And I'm open to questions or comments. Well, I have to say that I thought my, my second uh, manuscript was ready after four reads. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. There's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, no, a lot of great stuff you said, Terry, a lot of great stuff. And, and, I, and I, I, I do remember the voices of the three women in second acts and how distinct they were and how one, one of the things that I think when a person does that, when they, when they use different voices and create different characters and a section ends and then another one begins and she, and uh, uh, Joy, um, uh, Terry goes from, from uh, one to the other, to the other, then back again. So it, it's not like a third of the book is Sarah, a third of the book is, I can't remember the three names, but it's not like that. It's back and forth and back and forth. And what I, what I've learned about that kind of, of, of structure is it gives you a little break in the action. If something is getting too dramatic or too tense or you, you don't know how the, the, it's gonna be resolved, well, you have to read on and you know, you know she's gonna come back and resolve it. And I, and I, 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 I referenced this last, last time, I think, or the time before that one of the first books I consciously read like that was the book, Sarah's Key. And, and that was a, a, a combination of, of a, a modern journalist looking into a Holocaust situation in which her family was involved, but she didn't know it at the time. And some of the Holocaust things, things were, were very hard to read. And you'd get to the end of a chapter and oh, fortunately now we're gonna to come to the present. You get a little bit of a break in the action. And, and the author does that intentionally, maybe to, to, to break up the, the intensity of something and to keep you coming back. The other, so the other thing I want, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt, I'm sorry. No, please. <laughs> I want I want to say is that and this is this will be applicable especially to those of you who are writing mem memoirs um, but it, it certainly works in fiction too. Um, it, another challenge with narrators, especially if you have more than one narrator, is is how you deal with time. And and in a memoir, you're going back. It, chances are you're going back and forth in time. You're not telling the story in a linear way. And um, I, that was another thing I looked for in in rereading a Joy Luck Club uh, because my novel, as you know, Lynn, goes back and forth in time, and and you don't want you don't want to make your reader dizzy. You want them to be with you as you as you move along. Thank you for saying what you did about the three about the three narrators. That was my biggest worry, and nobody. Not any. You know, I did I did a, a coast to coast book tour. Remember, pre-COVID, we could do that. Um, I, I, I have had lots of people write um, reviews on Amazon. Um, I've had, I've had um, newspaper and, and journal reviews. No one was confused by the, but no one was confused by the three voices. And, and I'm proud of, prouder of that than almost anything because that was my big concern. I heard them clearly, but I didn't know if I was making them clear to anybody else. Um, and, and part of it was because I was, in addition to having the three of them move the story along in their own way, each in their own way, um, I, um, I was going back and forth in time. So, um, so yes. um, 
I, I would like to I, I would like to ask you this issue about um, too many ca about characters. Car Carol had too a many. Yeah. May, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I just want to ask a question. Character um, consistency is absolute important, and you do a beautiful job of that. But how do you make room for character development? Because your characters grow and they change. You're not going to have someone who's evil Knievel all of a sudden, you know, do um, basket weaving by the end of the book. But how do you make room for character development and show the growth of your characters while still being true to their character and being consistent to their character? That's that's the ultimate challenge. I mean, that is that is what what you have to do. And um, and again, I don't want to you know, I don't want to be a broken record on this, but um, if you if you use the the Proust questionnaire or or something or something like that, um, and you fill out write out the answers to those questions, and in the and 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 if you're going to have your character suddenly do something out of character, you need to go back and say, is this does this sound like like the person who answered me the, this way in this in this que in this questionnaire is this consistent with the per persona i um i used to have my students my, my advanced writing students um watch um there was a this is so many years ago there was a a a, a detective or police police procedural tv show um that took place, in, I think, in, in, in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. Um, and, and it was, a, you know, it focused really on the DA and the prosecutor. Um, and it was very well done, very well acted. And I would have, but occasionally the characters, in my mind, would do something out of character. Mm -hmm. And I would have my students watch, watch this and and their assignment was to identify the moments when the characters were doing something that they really would never do. You know, so if you know your characters, the better you know your characters, the more likely it is that um, that that you won't have them doing something out of character, right? So yeah. know them. So you can have like a defining moment where all of a sudden they get courageous, right? Or before they weren't. And and, um, and this business, I did, I did, um, I did have so something about. Um, okay, so so I, here's a paragraph in my and what I wrote for you that I that I skipped over. Um, and, and I'll just read it to you. You need to understand your characters as if you were their shrink. Okay. Um, to make them three dimensional, to give them voices that sound authentic, you need to converse with them, understand their universe, even if you don't include all the details you know about them in the story. So, for example, if you're writing a mystery and creating a private detective as your main character, you should be aware, even if you don't include this in your in your story, you should be aware of how your character got into the business, what she or she he or she considers the toughest case ever, um, what the personal life is like. None of this may come up in your plot, but being able to have the detective say one sentence such as, there were times when I wish I was still in touch with my ex-husband, he would have loved this case. Right, they'll add it an, an unexpected dimension because in that sentence you learn something about the detective. You're not you're not deviating from the story, but you learn the detective was married. The detective still is no longer on speaking terms with her ex. The detective kind of wishes she was. There was some bond between them, um, and um, and he still comes up in her thoughts when she gets an interesting case. That's a lot to learn from one sentence, and you can do that without deviating from the plot and slowing the action down. So. Thank you. Yes. Richard. Richard. I'd like to uh, addend 
to your consistency and kind of go on with Carol. I just wrote young adult. Okay. That's one of the primary themes of young adult is coming of age, which means that through the entire arc of the book, yeah, yeah. the main character is making a major change in their initial profile. Now, it is important to keep a lot, the main basis of who they are, the same and be consistent, but you are going for a change of character. Of course. Well, I agree with Carol also that there are, and it doesn't have to be things out of character. These are <laughs> gradual changes in character. Yes. So you have to add that. Absolutely, absolutely. That's very well said, thank you. Neil? No, no, okay. I was waving to the people who were leaving. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were flagging us down. Um, any other any other questions? Yeah, yeah I, I, wanna, I wanna go back to something um, about the characters. When you talked about um, how many characters are too many characters? I mean, what, what, what's, the, what's the, the, the metric on that? I mean, I, I, um, I you know, the, the characters in this uh, second uh, book that I'm writing, um, that I've written, they, they, all, they all support the story. They're all part of the family. They all support the story. Um, I, I don't see any of them as extraneous because they're, they're stories, they're, their stories are part of the whole story. So how, how do I, how do no, I, there's no formula. There's no formula. You know, again, war and peace, there are a thousand characters with unpronounceable names. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, it, it um, I would say that this is a great question for your critic. Okay. When you get somebody who's going to be brutal with the criticism about it, ask specifically, do you think I have too many characters? Well, it, it was it was told to me by by uh, by somebody who's a writer that 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 um, if the characters don't move your story forward, you don't really need them. That's so, right. I mean, what what you said about the, the waiters, you know, the waiters, unless this is going to be a story about a restaurant, somebody taking over a restaurant, and the waiters becoming main characters. That's not that's not really relevant to moving it along. So as I'm writing this, I'm thinking to myself the, the characters are all in my particular case, they're all family members. They're not, they're not outsiders and they all, they all have a role in moving the story forward. So I feel, I feel good about the characters that I have, but I've read books where there are too many characters and they take away from the main idea. So I have to, I guess, ferret that out a little bit. Yes. Ask, take a couple of the, of the minor characters and ask yourself how the story would, would be without them. Without them. One at a time, you know, if this if this character disappeared from the story and I took the important elements of that person's persona and put it and gave it to somebody else <laughs> and gave those those qualities to somebody else with that with that unclutter, you want you don't want it to be cluttered and and only, you know, you you have a sense if you need all of them, you need all of them. But but again, ask, find a critic. Find the right critic. And the whole idea about setting, about setting being a character, I, I, I love that phrase because my, this, this book is set in, in, uh, in Long Island and um, it's Jewish family. And I, in the, in the third or fourth iteration, I've, um, I, I've, I've fleshed that out more in terms of describing different places on Long Island. There's a setting of the Hamptons. Part of the book is in the Hamptons. And, so I talk about that for people who don't know anything about, you know, that part of Long Island. I talk about uh, um, diners, what, what diners are. There are places in the country that we don't have diners. So I do a whole description about what a Long Island diner is. Um, I, I thought that was, you know, that was important to, because it's, 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 all, it's, all, it's all part of how these people all lived and how they grew up. And if you read this book from the middle of the country, from, you know, middle of, of Iowa, you may not know anything about a diner. I mean, I live in Las Vegas. We don't we don't have diners for a diner. Yeah. I'd get for a real diner. Yes, I know. Yes, yeah, so you know, so that's important to know. You can go someplace at one o'clock in the morning and have a have a steak, or at six o'clock in the morning you could have it. You know, you could have uh, you could have eggs if you want. That's you know, that's that's something. I, I thought there was a richness to that. 
So uh, I didn't do it in the, the first round, but somebody suggested that I do it. So I went back and I stretched out the diner with the jukeboxes and the, the booths and the back rooms and how people sometimes, because it's such a 24 hour thing, they would go after their own wedding or their own party because they never ate anything at their own party. And they would go in the middle, you know, two o'clock in the morning and have eggs or something. So that, that was a real thing that happened to me. So, um, you know, so I, 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 I love the idea of, of setting, being, being, being a character, you know, I think that that's, uh, and, and people, I guess, do the same thing. Um, uh, my brother just wrote a book and he, he, um, he has the dog as, as the main character. That dog is throughout, throughout everything in, in, in this, in this particular book. I think the dog is in there too much, but you know, that's, that's, that's my particular feeling, but he said, you know, the dog is a character. The guy takes the dog everywhere. It gives him support. It gives him comfort. It, 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 it eases transition between him not knowing what to say to the girlfriend because the girlfriend is petting the dog's head. So, you know, that, that character is, uh, is, is, is that, that, that dog becomes a character. No, so I, I just, yeah, that, that's, um, uh, I, I, and in uh, first of all, I'm, <laughs> I just wrote a scene for my new novel that takes place in a diner. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm in New York. So I, that's kind of, kind of funny to hear you if you hear <laughs> talk about that. Um, I, I did want to say something, um, and this is just a, a sort of you know, as writers, uh, we're all you know, in 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 a club, uh, in a in a culture. There's a there's a writer's culture, and every culture has its rules. And so something you might not be aware of is that is the difference between describing somebody as an author or a writer. Um, anybody can write. Anybody can write anything. An author is somebody who's actually been published. And and um, and so, um, you know, Lynn, Lynn said I became an author with second acts, but really I was an author 30 years ago when I was writing a magazine column. And I published poetry and I published essays, um, academic kind of stuff that six people read, but hey, I yeah. was an author. And and um and so and so as you, you know, as you become part of the writer's culture or the author's culture, as you get as you get published, um, that's something you might want to you might want to keep in mind. Um yeah, setting his character. I and and I I just I'd give anything. I I'm about to write an email to everyone I might have at the time sent this this um, uh, interview to the interview I did for the British publication. See if anybody still had it in their email and and but I probably just sent the link, and the link doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So, um, but that, that's a, you know, um, it's, it's something that it sounds as if you're on your way, Lynn, to, to turning the diner into a character in the, in, in, in your, in your work. And that's great. Um, well, se se several, several important conversations <clears throat> happen, happen in a diner. Yep. So like there's one, one, one introduction that I, that I go another Tuesday, another diner, more eggs, you know? So it's, uh, you know, that, that that's the setting of these, these conversations that family members have because they're convenient places to meet. Well, well, with that opening, you have created a scene. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and please, you know, jump in. I, I'm certainly not Hello, the only one here. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, just, we can't see you though. Can you adjust the phone so we can see your face? I see her. Oh, me? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I just didn't want you to forget the Greek food. <laughs> uh, the Greek food. You're right. The Greek salad. All about the Greek food as far as we're concerned. <laughs> we're in New York. Oh, and, the yeah. and, and the desserts. Right. <laughs> and the desserts. I'll say something. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, who's who's talking? Let, let the gentleman go ahead first. The gentleman who's laying down. I can't, I don't know his name. Who's laying down? Oh, is it me? I'm. It, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't tell. Yeah. I, yes, I, I was saying 
it's in Stalin. I can see your face. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Stalin. Okay. I'm in my trailer. I'm in my trailer. So okay. I have my hat on. It's me. Ah, there you go. I couldn't. Okay. I have a question for my book. What do you do when my book? I want it to be fiction, but a memoir, and it's going to be controversial as hell. Like I feel, if I write the book that I want to write. I'm going to have to move to like some cabin in Nantucket when it's published, like because the stories, the characters, there's three, I'll start with that, maybe a fourth. And the two characters, because me and my daughter and my mom experienced this traumatic event together, our stories and the way we are so interwoven, you can't take one out. And the way that, if I'm honest, my mom's not gonna like how this book comes out. So that's one thing. And the fourth character, is actually very controversial but I think needs to be in the book and people aren't going to like it it's actually the shooter um because I looked at it like who was this guy in the fourth grade I'm a teacher um so I kind of researched who who are these people in the fourth grade what what leads to this and um learned a lot about his background um again no one's going to like that no one wants to mention his name so like, I feel if I write the book I want to write the way that I want the story, I'm going to have to leave the country. I okay. mean, I'm being honest. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, well, let me, let me start with, what is your name? What is your name? Oh, I'm iPhone, but I'm Starlin. Starling? Starlin. 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 Star's fine. Star's fine. Okay. Star. <laughs> um, uh, so, so let me step back for a minute. This is is this a memoir or is this fiction? Is this a novel? Both. I think it's going to be fiction. Be I wanted to start it as a memoir, but uh, because of my memory from the event, I like the idea that it's fiction because I can use other people's memories. My, I'm a Route 91 survivor and my, my brain kind of blocked a lot of stuff out. But in talking with other people that were around me, my mom, like I'm able to piece some things together. I see. So, Okay. So that's why I want to go the fiction route. Yeah, well, well, it, it, it needs to be one or the other. Okay. If you want anybody to read this, it needs to be one or the other. And those of you who have authors among us who have published, um, uh, you know that that one of the questions you're going to be asked is on what shelf at Barnes & Noble, remember when we used to be able yeah. to get yeah. on what yes. shelf does it belong? And, true. And, um, and so um, you need to... I would, if I were you, um, I wouldn't for now worry about how anybody else is going to react. I yeah. would tell my story. I would tell my story in as authentic a way as I can. And if you begin, I mean, you said something significant here. You said um, there are pieces of this story that are lost to me, but this is how, this is what I remember. And some other people have helped me fill in some of the gaps. Um, I would start there. I would, because oh, okay. that lets your reader know what to expect from you. They know you're telling a story as best you can. And, and, and I would be careful as the story unfolds onto the page that you identify clearly what parts are actual memories of yours and what, and what parts are, are, uh, from other people who are helping you fill in those gaps. But I, I think it, it, you know, do not worry what anybody else is going to think about it for now. Tell your story and then you'll be able to go from there. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. It's just hard because I put stuff on paper and then I throw it away because I'm like, like, I still have that. Like I, there's, if I'm going to tell the authentic story, like there's so many things, like even people very close to me don't know. And I don't know if I want that. Oh, it's just touch. Don't, don't throw anything away. Don't okay. Throw anything, away. Don't throw anything away. Keep it all. You never know. Don't throw okay. anything away and just keep writing. Keep and telling. Star, star, there is a genre called fictional autobiography, such okay. as Catcher in the Rye, Dandelion Wine. So if you want to go the route where it is based on truth, but you want to make it a fiction, that is a possible route to go. Right. Yeah, I, there's a book that I'm trying to get through that I read 
before this all happened to me called 19 minutes by Judy Bacol. Yes. And it's, oh. it's, it's, it's about the, it was written after Columbine. Yeah. And so I read it shacked me up before this even happened. And then this happened. So I'm trying to reread it, but I remember how impactful that was. So that's where I got the idea from you guys of the fiction, like that. And she makes the shooter a character. Well, well, to tell your story the way it feels most comfortable and natural to you. Okay. And 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 once you get a first draft of this of the, of the the elements of the story, then <laughs> a decision: Do I want to tell this as as a straight up memoir? Do I want to fictionalize it? Do I want a novel based on a true story? It's okay. up to you. But 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 again. Whatever anybody else may think is not what you should be focusing on right now, in my opinion. Okay. It's hard. <laughs> of course, it's hard. Sure. Writing anything is hard. And this is especially yes. difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, good luck. Can I say something real quick? Yes. Go ahead, Jade. Please. Um, when speaking of having multiple characters in a book and their, their stories being a constant thread throughout, I find that the more characters there are, more difficult of a time I have keeping track of them. For example, I read a book that got rave reviews called There, There. And there were so many people in this book, I almost needed a whiteboard to put their names down <laughs> and a little brief description of them because by the end, I was pulling out my hair. There were just far too many. A few, yeah. few of them could have been cut in their entirety or perhaps put into one person. Uh, 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 three of them could have been one person. So that's my two cents worth but, not as an author, but I, as an avid reader. Yes, and that, per that author needed a good editor. Excuse me, who, who was speaking? I, I, I don't see a picture on the gallery. Who, who was just speaking? Patty. I'm sorry, Patty. Patty Schmidt. Okay, okay. I I didn't see. Yeah. I heard. Of, I, I she's on my gallery. I, I okay, didn't. okay. I I didn't see her. Sharon, did you want to say something? Unmute uh, yourself, Sharon. Uh oh. Yeah. You're good. Uh, You're good. Yeah. Um. Okay. Can you go through that again because we couldn't hear her. It was very difficult. No. To hear. We just didn't see her. We if she could just repeat her question or comment. Peggy, can you do that on mute yourself from, and, and, and Patty. do it again? Patty. Patty. So that's Patty. Patty. Um, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I don't know what's wrong with this computer today. Um, what I was saying was too many characters in a story were on occasion difficult to keep track of. For example, I read the book, There, There, which got rave reviews, and it was a very compelling story. But by the end, it was so confounding to me because there were too many people to keep track of. One person could have been three. Uh, three people could have been one, rather than have all these people and all their stories. And, and, and it was just hard to hard to manage for me. And I read all the time, so it's not like I'm a, a novice at it. I do my best to keep track, but this was way, way, way too much. So he could well, I, 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 I think that's a very good point. I've had that experience also reading a book and I'm reading it and I'm paying attention and I'm focused and all of a sudden a character comes out and I don't know where, where it came from. And, and what and what the relevance was. And then I flip back pages. Was there something I missed? Was there and and it 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 really it really does detract. That's why I asked the question about how many characters and you know there's no there's no no right or wrong answer. They 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 have to be relevant to the story. And like I said, somebody told me you have to they, it has to move the story forward. Otherwise they're 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 extraneous. Um, I want to ask Michael. Michael can I, can I ask Michael, Michael, can you unmute yourself? Michael, unmute yourself. This is a new person who joined our group. Michael, can, can we help you with anything? Is there, is a, this is Michael from, 
from Australia who I met on the tennis court. And, <laughs> and he's, he's joined our group and I know he, was, he, had, he had written something and was looking for a little, a little guidance. Can, can, do, is, is there something that, that Terry can help you with? Um, the, the only thing really, and I, I've enjoyed this immensely and I've made Great. a bucket of notes here and I'm gonna share these with my uh, co, uh, we'll call him a co-writer at this point because we've only self-published. So I, don't, I can't really call us authors yet, um, but we have a second, we have a sequel that is very close to being finished. We're gonna go ebook with the first one. And a lot of that really is related to the fact that Australia has been locked down. You can't even go to a bookstore and buy a book at the moment, okay. you know, pretty much anywhere. Anyway, that's, that's so when, when you're starting a sequel, I would imagine, yes, yeah, some of the same rules apply, but some of them don't. You have a little more freedom to yeah. do different things and not... Um, and, and also there's a... I, I watched a, a blog from somebody. Um, as, you, as your characters develop and you, and you get to a second or a third or whatever iteration of something, um, you, your ability to use suspension of disbelief you have more free reign to, to go further, become more outrageous with the characters or have them in more expansive situations maybe. Can you comment on that? Well, I, I, it's interesting. I, I, as I started um, to write the sequel to, to, to Technax, which is, which is called The Right Regrets, um, the challenge for me, I'm, I, I'm trying to think who's my reader. If if the reader read Second Acts, somebody picks up this book in the bookstore and says, oh good, more about these characters I met in, in Second Acts, that's a little easier. Um, that I mean, you don't wanna bore that person by talking about the stuff to remind them who the characters are. And then you have somebody who just picks up the book and says, gee, this looks interesting and knows nothing about the original, right? Nothing about the first in the series. And so you have to give, you have to find a balance. You have to give, give that reader enough information about the character so that they don't feel they've walked into the middle of the movie, right? So um, uh, what was your question? <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, exploring going a little further, being more expansive with the characters. With the, with the characters, yeah. I think, I think- um, Into the disbelief or whatever you want to call it. Uh, okay, um, what, may I ask what what kind of, give me a thumbnail sketch of the first book? What was the uh, first book? I joined the military when I was 15 years old in Australia as an apprentice. We are all herded onto a military aircraft, flown. None of us have probably been on an aeroplane. Some of us are <coughs> away from our parents. Some of us, are, some of, some people miss their parents. You're all thrown together. We're basically a bunch of teenage kids, unsupervised, no adult supervision. So we get into trouble fairly quickly and fairly early on various fronts. And when I look back, and, and so a, a friend of mine and I who joined up at the same time have written this and we're just using what some of the basis and then extrapolating in different directions and doing different things. Um, so are you, are you taking your characters beyond the military? Uh, we will, but that's probably book three. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is, this is more of the story you told in the. Yeah. In the it's, a, it's a, it's a follow on. There's a gap. Um, some things have changed Some things have moved on. Some have stayed the same. The core characters remain the same. So, so I got good news and bad news for you, Michael. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. The good news is that um, is that this sounds, you know, this sounds like um, the kind of story that I mean, just the way you've presented the overview here sounds. It sounds like a story that's going to grab people's attention. The bad news is for the or the or the challenging part is. For the first, I think for you, those first five pages of this book you're working on are going to be critical. You are going to have to, in that, establish, um, establish the most important 
characteristics of the most important characters you created in the in the in the first book and you have to find a way to do that you may think about doing a retrospective sort of a flashback so that the so that the characters who are speaking we we have done that you have done that great minds think alike how's that um so so you so you have um but you're going to, I hope, rewrite those first five pages 150 times because you want to make sure that every word in, in that beginning serves the purpose of, of painting a picture of the characters that somebody who didn't read book one will, will be able to relate to. Okay, so, so the most, you know, the most important, you know, write, make a list make a list of the most important things a reader will need to know about these characters in those first five pages. Okay. Establish them. Yeah. And yeah. And, um, and I think that will do it. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Can I jump in please? This is Jade. Hi Jane. Hi. Um, well, thank you so much for your, um, your, your guidelines with your characters. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually thinking about two books. I know this, this, this sounds crazy, but I'm going around in a circle in a circle with, with the book I'm working on and your points are well taken. And I, and I had listened to Lynn and, and everybody else, um, with my, with my particular storyline, um, mine also is a family and, and I go with the, with the premise, if it, if it adds to the entire storyline, if it's an integral part, they need to be there. If it's fluff, like you're saying about the waiter, you don't need that. You, you just, you might not even name your, your waiter, say. Okay. That said, I'm tabling that idea for now because I, I have so much information. Like I said, I'm going around and around and around and I'm getting nowhere. So I have seen these books a while. And I just went, went to the library again because models, are, everything has to be modeled for a children's book, if you will. And I'm now going back to this simple idea. And I know I will get a book written from this. It's the ABC concept. So these, these were just um, put out the summer of 21, okay? And my book is going to be called, I already have the title, I have the the, uh, the cover, because I think Joanne had mentioned also, think about the cover, the ABC of the America Pica. So it's going to be simple facts about that particular critter. And then my second book, it's not going to be a series, but my second book is going to be the story of family about all the things that happened to them. It's action packed, it's predator and prey. It's climate um, change, it's endangered species, it's all of that. But right now I'm, I'm, I have so much stuff going on, I'm getting nowhere. So I figured if I could do an ABC book, for instance, this is all about eyeballs and it's got, I don't know if you can see it, but every letter represents something to do with the, with the animal kingdom. This one's very creative, again, it's 2020, 21 concepts is I for immigrants. And what they've done here is they have a letter and all the things that come up with a, with a particular immigrant, they have illustrated. So again, mine is gonna be more of a children's book, picture book kind of a thing, but yet based on science. So it's truly gonna be a narrative because that was another thing Joanne was kind enough to point out with my first idea book that it would be a narrative science-based, but this one will totally be an, a narrative. So are you liking that? I mean, I wanted just to get something tangible and done at this point, and then um, something easier, because like I said, I'm just overwhelmed with all this. So what are you thinking? What's your thinking? Okay, um, uh, well, um, my first question, are you an illustrator as well? No, I'm not. I might have a few people lined up, but I'm not even sure about that. We've talked about it, but nobody has said definitely yes to me. Yeah, okay. Um, 
that that's going to be critical for a, for an ABC book. Okay. Um, so so because you have to um, you have a vision of of, of what you want th this book to be, and you need to find somebody who who not only is talented as a graphic artist, but who has the, a, a vision that's compatible with 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 yours, and. Okay. And I and and my guess is, um, yeah, you know, say you want something easy. Well, you're in the wrong business if you want something easy. Well, I know about any of this, but but here's, you know, I would um, the ABC book sounds terrific. I would um, uh, start with um, a description, two, three, four sentences that you can, that will start the conversation with an illustrator, right? About what, what you're trying to do with this book, why it is different from all the other ABC books on okay. the market um, and uh, what the age group is um, that you're, I mean, there are ABC books that are for babies and there are ABC books that are for four-year-olds. And, and so you need to, okay. You know, um, and um, and so so you're a, a kind of you know when in corporate life they call a mission statement right so so you want you want a kind of mission statement for this book and I think you will things will are more likely to fall into place after you've got a, an illustrator lined up and and it will be to find somebody who understands that vision that you've defined who whose mission statement at least overlaps with yours. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that direction. Okay. I'd like to jump in on uh, an analogous situation to this character question that a lot of people were asking. So I just wrote a YA high fantasy. The world has eight colored moons, 12 creature and human types, 15 enchantments, on and on and on. And what I found was that when I was on a particular scene, I don't mention anything that's irrelevant to that scene. And if it's something that's going to come up over again, like the, the green moon, whose name when I first introduce it is weak. So I have all these crazy names. Later on, when I talk about it in the moon, I don't call it weak. I call it the green moon so that you don't have to try to remember all the names. So that's focus on what you're actually saying at the time and not worry about the expanse except for where they are important. Let, let me tell you, know, um, that, that is such a, that's such an important point. Thank you. Uh, the, um, when I had my early draft of, of um, by the way, my, my, my book started, uh, Second Acts began in a completely different way. The, the story, I, I, write, I wrote a short story. I wrote a short story. A friend of mine had lost her college age son. He suicided. And I was, she was a friend from college and we were very close. And I spent a lot of time with her afterwards. And one of the things that struck me was, was the support she got from the female friends from every chapter of her life. Everybody rallied. To, to support her. And I wanted to write a short story about that kind of friendship and, and, and how, how important it was. And I wrote the short story and I showed it to a friend, a writer, an author, friend. And she said, it's a great short story, except it's too big for a short story. It looks like something else. And she said to, and, and that became Second X. It became a whole book. And getting back to Richard's point, um, uh, there were aspects of her story, of this, this person's story, that um, I go into detail uh, with it about, about how her son died when she is first speaking, when she's first introduced in the book. But later on, I only hint at it. I only hint at it. I don't retell it. I don't, there's not even a full sentence. And, um, I, I, and I remember there's, there's one, 
there's one part where she talks. So she's uh, uh, the worst part is that this character is a is a psychologist, a PhD psychologist and therapist, and and she she feels guilty because she couldn't help her own son, and um and I wanted to talk about to talk about um, how years later how her life is still colored by that experience how that how that never changed am i going to three chapters later talk again about how she lost her son no so my first few attempts were too wordy too repetitious too much you know a, a reminder of the first and i and it took me a long time but i came up with with a scene in which she in the building where she where her office is where she, where she does therapy she passes passes another tenant um, um, an eye doctor or somebody, a speech therapist, a speech therapist who's who's um, uh, whose office is in the same building and and whose kid went to school with her kid, right? Went to high school with her kid, and she says that you know something like they're polite, but they hurry away. People are never sure how to greet somebody who's lost their child. And that, and that said it, how long did it take me to come up with that? I, I can't even count that high. You know, it, it's just, it takes, you know, it took a long, it, you know, it took a long time. So, um, so yeah, you, you, you can say green moon three chapters later and that's all you have to say. That's all, and that you, you recognize that is so important. Right. Um, sometimes in in our own work, we don't recognize that, and that's where your critic comes in. So that that phrase, uh, uh, Terry, that phrase that you that you used, uh, it, it, that that comes up. It, it's it's something that's a very, it's a very visceral thing, and and I and I've read that many places, many experienced it in my own life. That uh, when people meet somebody who's sustained a loss like that. They talk about everything other than yes that, and they don't know what to say. They don't know. I I, I just came across it in, in something. Oh, oh, in 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 uh, um, yeah, in, in a book I just I just finished. They they don't know what to say, and people tend to to go around, you know, the expression is circle the airport, and they don't really say what they want to say. And sometimes the person who sustained the loss very much wants that acknowledgement as opposed to, you know, person wasn't, wasn't worth even mentioning it, you know, now. So that's that, just that phrase that, that Terry used, it, it really, it really says volumes and it says volumes about anybody who's sustained a loss, whether it be a, a parent, whether it be a child, whether it be a, a spouse, that kind of, of dis, discomfiture that people have about it. I, I think we've all experienced that in some way. And in terms of writing, as a writer, I want to do that in as few words as possible. I want to do it in one sentence. Because right? it's not necessary. It's not necessary because people not know what it is. Along, it's just adding a dimension to this character. So from right. the sentence, we know that she has had numerous encounters with people that has made her understand that, that so many people are uncomfortable. Um, but, but it, but it had to be done. It was my green moon, Richard. It was my green moon. Right. And, and, uh, I, I just wanted to say, look at the green moon and, and not talk again about what the green moon means. So, so it sounds like you're, you're doing great. Anybody else? Um, can, can we, uh, Katie, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to, would you like to jump in? Is there something you want to ask Terry? Katie? Um, no, I, I'm just immensely enjoying everything she's saying. I thank you so much, Terry. You oh, my pleasure. A lot for me. I, okay. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because I'm, what I'm considering writing is not really going to be very, not much toward the fiction genre. Um, so I don't really, but, but I love everything. I've written a lot of it down about the character questionnaire. And so what so, are you writing? What are you thinking about writing? Oh, kind of a memoir. 
or alternatively, sort of a um, sound bites from people I meet in very okay. gambling. In gambling. Well, it's not gambling. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. poker. <laughs> Poker's a game of skill. My my late husband. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I was a poker player. My, 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 I, I, my late husband was a professional poker player. I met right. him. He was, he was oh. Ken Emery. Okay. Was, was his name. And he, he, a long story, but he was my second husband. He died suddenly four years ago. He died six weeks before my book came out. I'm so sorry, Terry. My first novel. I'm, I'm scheduled for a coast to coast tour. And he had the bad timing to, to have a heart attack and die unexpectedly on the spot. And, and I, um, my family would not let me cancel the tour and, and, and the tour saved my life in a way. I mean, it brought me, it, 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 was, it was a big help, but um, that's a very colorful, interesting world, Katie. Well, and it is, and you meet, you meet people from every imaginable walk of life and the stories that you hear and the little snippets in of insight into people I just find it so fascinating just sitting there at the poker table and you witness so much so so so, so that was so that was that was what Katie said the first session we had that was what Katie said that she thought she might write about the 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 little stories about people and she called it she her expression was snippets of a lifetime and I, and I and I wrote it down and I said that's your title snippets of a lifetime of humanity yeah let, let, uh, of humanity sorry I don't I don't have my notes from last week you're right you're right snippets yeah, there, of are books, there are a lot of people have written about that world a lot of movies have been made about that world I I know I've read many and so um it, it, Fiction or nonfiction, the rules are the same. You've got to find an angle that's new, that's fresh, that will interest somebody besides you. Right. Right. And um, and the characters, you know, if you're telling the story, if you are inserting yourself into, into the story and saying, you know, not um, Joe Blow was an interesting poker player, but the first time I met Joe Blow, he was said so so if you're there if you're in then you are the character you're the main character of this of this uh, story and you need to you need to uh, create a voice for yourself that will draw people in that will make people feel comfortable and that will be consistent throughout you have many aspects to your life i'm sure besides poker and that world so you have to you have to choose a voice of your many voices to tell that story, okay? And you need to tell it in a way that is, um, you need to have an angle that is that is uh, that hasn't been done yet. Right, right, right. And, that, and reading reading other other poker memoirs will will help you with 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 that, you know. <laughs> You know, so so um, so that's going to be your challenge. You know, there's always a challenge in writing, and right. and yours is going to be to tell um, your story in a unique way, in a way that hasn't been told, it, 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 to give some some um, a window into the poker world that mm -hmm. nobody has opened yet. Right, right, right. Um, one last question, Terry. What was your for, your late husband's first name again? N. H E N. Ken. 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 Oh, that was my brother's name. Ken. Ken. Yeah. Ken. Okay. yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Joy, Joy and, and Judith, we have about 10 minutes left. If either one of you would like to ask Terry a question, please, we heard from everybody today. If you have something you'd like to ask the expert. Joy, well, unmute. I want to thank, thank Terry. You go, Joanne. Go. Thank you, dear. I wanted to thank Terry. It was everything was spot on and just absolutely resonated um, and was delightful. So thank you. Tara. Oh, Joanne, thank you. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to, to look, to be at yours, but I will look at it online. Thank you. Yes, yes. And yes. then I wanted to say to Katie, 
as she was talking, I was captured by the auditory aspect of the snippets. Now, maybe there's visual too, but today she seemed to be saying, I kept hearing different things. And then I started hearing kind of echoes of Carl Sandburg and even George Gershwin, uh, Rhapsody in Blue. It became almost an auditory memoir. And I was wondering if you could distill some of the sounds that are kernels of those snippets and maybe even create a little poem where those things kind of flash by your ears as you're doing the dealing or whatever you're doing, the, the sound of the machine, the sound of people just winning, just create um, a sound memoir of one of those evenings or afternoons. And I think that that might provide you a real jumping off spot for what comes next. <laughs> Interesting, Joanne, thank you, because yeah. there's so much background going on as well. And so, Katie, um, I'm, I'm also thinking about, about something, you know, people who don't live in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. uh, Think that uh, think of poker as gambling. It's it's anything but gambling. And 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 you 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 mentioned something about that. My late husband Ken would would when people said you know oh you're a gambler. No, I'm a poker player. I'm not a, I'm not a gambler. And in fact, our joke you know I was uh, we went to high school together. We we met at the 40th class reunion. That's uh, that's a whole story in itself. And and I wound up me living in Las Vegas. I moved here, I married him, we bought a house together and here I am 14 years later. And, and <laughs> we would say when somebody referred to him as a gambler, I would say, you know, I gave up a rent control department in Manhattan to move to Las Vegas, to live with somebody and buy a house with somebody and marry somebody I'd really only known for five minutes in my adult life. We knew each other in high school, but in my adult life, who's the gambler? He's a poker player. I'm the gambler. And so, and, and in <laughs> fact, in fact, in temperament, uh, he was much more reserved and, and, and careful and cautious than I am. I'm the, I'm the risk taker. And that is why he made a better poker player than I would have made. Be analytical. The other thing is a lot of people who don't know poker rooms in Las Vegas, they think of, and I sometimes hesitate to say I'm a poker player because they think of these dark, you know, dank, depressing, smoky poker rooms from the 50s. And you know, I play at the win, which is ultra high end, right? Posh, very moneyed clientele. So it's that's a good point to point this out to people who don't understand. And I like Joanne's point too, which is, you know, it's not just this table of nine people, it's everything going on in the background, you know, from you know, the people walking by, you know, to go to the clubs to just everything going on right. so, yeah it's great thank you so much everybody for pointing i gotta say out. i gotta say something you guys just the fourth person in my book that i was referring to was a professional poker player i know i know so I, what I, you I, guys I, just said just well he was almost. he was no he was a he was mostly slots but, video poker or something well yeah he did not play in the poker rooms i never and, and star i i'm so okay. you know captivated by what you've gone through and and i can't wait for your story to come out and i i just have so much respect for you but i was paying so much attention to that story because of who he was he was yeah he was a machine player he was not a table player right correct um, yeah different culture so it's different culture. that's different Totally so different. different. Yeah. Totally different. Oh, because I'm not a gambler, but I've learned a little bit because of my research. Yeah. A true professional poker player is extremely disciplined, um, restrained, analytical, strategic. That's what really goes into a very elite professional poker player. I, okay. my, my my late husband made his living. He never had a real job. Yeah. 
never had a job. He made his living playing poker in the days, starting in the days when it wasn't respectable to do that. He oh. made his living playing playing poker and and um and when we when we lived when we first moved in together and I had an old uh, um, a printer with a fax machine um he didn't know how to use the fax machine because he had never had a job where he had to learn how to use a, a fax machine and, yeah. and and that was you know it, it was a whole a whole different world anyway um Thank you. Everybody have good luck. Good luck, Katie. I want to hear more about what you're doing. Um, yeah. Um, All right. I we have uh, we have just a couple of minutes. I I, I had asked if, if Judith or, or Joy wants to jump in with any any question they have. I don't know whether anybody heard me because we got diverted in another direction. Yeah. Uh, ladies, you have anything you'd like to uh, say? I would like to just say thank you, thank you, thank you to Terry. Yeah. I mean, I, can we adopt you or something? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so, I'm so delighted. I'll, I'll, I just want to say something. If any of you are, are inspired to read Second Acts, that would be great. For that and for every book you ever read by anybody, if you care about the author, do the author a favor and leave a review on Amazon. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be long, as long as it's a five-star review. Amazon <laughs> tracks those five-star reviews and they make and they help market the book if you get a certain number of them. So that means the world to any any author. So I yeah. just well, it's just been it's been a pleasure. Joanne's comment was brilliant as far as Katie's book. You know, I I just have never written a bloody thing uh, except for a beauty book because that, uh, I I knew that. But it, this is a fable and. Uh, you gave me so much, so many new ideas, and now I have fourteen beginnings <laughs> that I have to figure out which one. <laughs> that's that's the process. That's part of the process. Yeah. And I would only like to add how, without being just ditto, I I have so appreciated what you all have to say. I've been part of a writers group for twelve years here in Las Vegas. We are not the ideal writers group, unfortunately. We all love each other and are very laudatory and, and don't know how to um, offend. We, we stay away from offend. Anyhow, what we've done is be able to maintain eight people who write and value each other's opinion and, and have been productive in that area. I, I unfortunately wrote my memoir and self-published it uh, six years ago too early only because I thought I was coming toward the end of my life and I was past 80 and decided I had to write a cookbook for my children. And it started out to be a, a, all of the life experiences where I've traveled and how I've cooked. And it turned into a memoir uh, called um, a, a Life Not Auspicious But Decidedly Delicious. And, <laughs> and now if I do it, Thing, it will be to revise that memoir uh, if I can only find a, a hard copy of it. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you for the inspiration. That's that's what I want. Oh, thank you. It's oh. wonderful. Well, I, I think this was this was just a very very rich session, and 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 I, I thank everybody who participated. Everybody had interesting things to say, and the whole the whole uh, thrust of this is if you listen to the presenter and you have ideas or it gives you ideas or it gives you something to think about with regard to your own writing. That's the whole, you know, I use the expression, pay it forward. Everybody, everybody went through these experiences. If you've written and you've tried to publish or you have published or you've had an editor uh, read your work, these, these are all common things that, that, that we go through. And you just, it's just, it's so, it's so honorable to, to have people share it because these are real people sharing real experiences, and it gives it gives um, it, it it gives life to the whole process, and it makes you know that that in our in our little group here in Las Vegas, um, a lot of things happened, and that was the whole concept of this: taking local, published people in our community who could exp who could talk about their experiences 
and 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 lead us and i think that that's what we've done we have next week we have our last session and i'm i'm thrilled to to um to introduce this this is uh, a person who um, wrote, just wrote a novel called The Last Birthday Party, happens to be my brother. And mm -hmm. he's a writer in California. He writes for the newspaper. He's written many, many screenplays. He's been writing for over 30 years. And he's agreed to do a session on how to find a publisher. So even though that's down the road for many of us, um, gaining the experience of somebody who did an exhaustive search to find a publisher He's gonna talk about the types of publishers and um, maybe even agents and how you go about finding somebody. And um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the end result of, of the writing. The draw. <laughs> uh, so can, that, sorry? Will you um, send uh, the, the link or the name um, for all of the questions that we are to ask the characters so to Neil? Yeah. so that he can include that in this week's notes. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, on the chat, I'm gonna write now, right. Um, oh, 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 yes, here we go. I'm gonna chat, it's the, it's <coughs> Marcel Pro. 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 Let me see, uh, type message here. Okay, Marcel Proust. <coughs> Proust, P R. -O I, I, I will. I will put this in notes also, Sharon. Like I oh, always do. I'm not. I'm not home now, but I'll. I'll get it done by tomorrow night. I'm. I'm out of town. Oh, that's fine. I, I will you. do it like I always do. It's my pleasure to do that. <laughs> um, thank Neil for for doing. You know, putting it together for us, keeping us all on screen. Um, oh, thank you so much to everybody. This was a yeah. really, really rich session, and I'm just so happy that so many people were here. Thank you. So, okay. Have a great thank week. You. Thank you. Yep. Thank Have you. a great week to everybody and and